Alrighty, well, we can see there's a fair few of you who have already jumped in, so we will get started. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining uh, one of the APCO community webinars where we like to explore the sustainability topics that matter most to our network. Before we jump in, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are separately meeting on today, and we are lucky enough to be able to connect across virtually. We recognise their continued connection to land, waters and culture, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So hopefully you are joining us because you are unsure of how to answer this question on the screen. What actually happens to a piece of packaging after it enters a recycling bin? So recycling is an action that the majority of us hopefully do um, every day in our homes or in our businesses or our offices. But it's something that not many of us, even in the packaging industry, really understand how this process of recycling works in practice. So today we are here to explore the journey that packaging takes beyond the bin. So that's through a material recovery facility and through to a reprocessor that then has to have end markets for those materials as well. So we're going to explore some of the biggest myths, misconceptions and challenges that the professionals in the resource recovery industry experience uh, and how organisations all along the packaging value chain can work together to overcome them. Here to help me work through all of this today and educate you all on this journey are two highly knowledgeable guest speakers. First up, we will hear from Lee Smith of Veolia, closely followed by Simon Van Leuven of Vanden Recycling. So thank you both very much for being here today to talk through this topic. Both have decades of experience and we really appreciate your time and contribution today. So before we dive into the complex packaging recycling journey, I wanted to quickly set the scene for those of you who aren't as familiar with the industry. I also wanted to just touch on how that fits into APCO's mission to help drive Australia to a circular packaging economy. Now that word alone might be a little bit confusing, a circular packaging economy. So what it really means is a whole packaging value chain that is collaborating to keep packaging materials out of landfill. By doing that, we maximise the circular value of the materials, energy and labour within our local economy. So everything that we consume is a resource and we want it to be treated that way so that it can stay in, that, in the system and move around and around. Um, and that makes sure we're not losing any of those resources. And by avoiding that loss, we're also keeping these valuable resources and their emb embedded, embodied energy and other resources um, to make sure that as they go into a product and packaging in the first place, we're keeping them in that system. Now that solution doesn't always have to be recycling. We'll put that disclaimer out there. However, recycling most certainly plays a really powerful role as the essence of recycling and that industry is in place to turn our waste resources back into a new resource to be used again. So where are we currently at with recycling in Australia? So what this diagram on your screen attempts to show you is simplifying the complexities of the recycling system that Lee and Simon will give you a lot more detail on. What I find most powerful about this image is that um, it really highlights how important the role of each of us as individuals make in making sure this system works properly. So the incoming 5.4 million tonnes coming in uh, at the first part of that diagram there, we can already see that first loss as it drops down. That 12% that we've estimated that isn't even designed to be recyclable in the first place. So we don't want it to be going through the recycling system and it's destined for landfill. So this is where um, APCO has a really valuable tool known as the Packaging Recyclability Evaluation Portal or the PREP tool. Now this tool takes out the complexities of the system and makes it really easy for manufacturers, brand owners or retailers to know whether or not that particular piece of packaging is recyclable and it can move through the system in practice. So this helps brands make informed decisions and choices at the start, um, ideally aiming to not put uh, not recyclable packaging on the market. Then after the brands and manufacturers have done all of that hard work, we then see that there's a loss again. So from that 4.8 million tonnes that are put on the market and should be able to be recycled, we see that loss again. 
Um, and this is because people like you and I are unsure of what's actually allowed to go in our recycling bin and what's not. And that's compounded by some pretty unclear and unverified on pack recycling messaging or symbols that confuses us all even more. So this is where the Australasian recycling label or the ARL plays a really important role. Again, taking that confusion out of the recycling system, it is really clear and consistent uh, for each separable component. And the ARL is evidenced by the packaging recyclability evaluation portal. It's also backed by a national consumer education campaign as consumer education is so vital and that is co-funded by the Commonwealth Government as well. So access to recycling bins is another problem that we have here and that's seen a lot with business uh, or commercial packaging. So a lot of resources lost at this point in the supply chain because the businesses uh, potentially don't have those collection uh, there at that site. And then the third loss we finally see there is at 18% uh, and this is through the sorting and reprocessing steps. This is from a combination of factors, but primarily uh, uh, the combination of the first two, which is where we see non-recyclable packaging making its way onto the market and then unsure consumers incorrectly putting that in their recycling bin. So we see contaminants that must be removed by recyclers to make sure they can have really clean and valuable streams so that they can be made into something new again. So just to quickly recap all of that, we see hopefully that's highlighted just how important it is to understand what recycling really means and how we can each play an important role. It's really important for our packaging to be designed to be able to accurately move through that the system and be effectively reprocessed. We also need to educate and inform customers or consumers through that really clear on pack information uh, and any other marketing and education tools as well. And then it's also really important for us to be seeking that education and, and actively educating our businesses, our families and our friends uh, to jump in and make sure that they're doing their part in the recycling stream as well. So enough from me, I will hand over to Lee. So Lee is originally trained as an architect. Uh, he's worked in the field of waste management, however, since uh, 1987. So in that time, he's been responsible for a number of recycling uh, industry changing developments in Australia and New Zealand. Lee has undertaken many, many study tours of waste management and material recovery facilities across Europe, North America, Asia, Africa and Oceania, and has even attended and presented at numerous local and international workshops and conferences. Over the past 30 years, Lee has worked for the Waste Management Incorporation, Veolia, Visi Recycling and in private consultancy. He is highly regarded as an expert in the waste collection, recovery, sorting, reprocessing and disposal systems and strategies. Lee is currently the manager for major waste and recycling projects in the Veolia National Office. He is also a director at uh, Mobius Environmental, and is a board member of ACOR and APCO. So thank you very much, Lee. Please take it away. Uh, thanks, Lily. In answer to the uh, question that this webinar poses, what happens to your recycling? I think the answer is it depends. And you'll see in uh, the presentations that are following that um, there are lots of variables. So you'll recall when we started recycling, oh, back in the, uh, in the 1980s for some people, and before then, um, we started with glass. When I was a kid, there was glass pickup, but nothing else. Then we added paper and cardboard to it, um, then steel cans, then aluminium cans. Then as we started getting more and more of our products um, in the home in um, plastic packaging, uh, we eventually added um, PET and HDPE plastic containers, uh, and then we added liquid paperboard. Then eventually we added all plastics, one to seven. Um, so you'll probably remember how recycling started. Uh, in most council areas, household uh, recycling was done with a single crate. Um, it was convenient, um, easy to store inside. Uh, you didn't have to um, go out in the rain to put your recycling out. Um, everything went in the crate. It limited the amount of recycling you could, uh, you could uh, put out to uh, the 50 litres of the crate, um, but it was easily, easily um, capable of one person lifting it. And then as the materials became more complex, um, so did the collection system. So we had 
um, councils had had a crate um, plus a, a, a separate pickup for um, uh, your cardboard. In some cases, they um, they said uh, put your glass out in a cardboard box so that was separated from the rest of the materials and so on. And uh, eventually, because uh, the glass manufacturers didn't want um, lots of other materials in their glass, and the cardboard manufacturers didn't want glass shards in their cardboard. Um, company collection companies came up with a bright idea of having a split bin. So they were split like this one, which was called north south from the back to the front, or east west from the the left side to the right side. Uh, the problem was that cross contamination, even though the trucks had separate compartments, cross contamination was pretty poor, and that experiment lasted. Uh, less than a decade and eventually um, we went back to uh, completely separate bins. So that now most um, large cities in Australia have got a three bin system or a two bin system. So um, in New South Wales the lids, are, the lid colours are fairly well standardised with red for waste, yellow for recycling um, and green for organics or, or garden organics if there is a garden organics um, component to the collection. So the recycling that goes in the yellow lidded bin is picked up by the recycling truck um, and uh, designers material should remember first up that to make um, collection efficient that material is compacted and it's compacted fairly strongly. So that the sorting systems that rely upon something being either flat like a piece of cardboard or three dimensional like a milk bottle are eventually going to be dealing with everything that is completely flat because it's compacted by the compactor vehicle, particularly in the summer when the volumes of recycling are much higher and um, to maintain transport efficiency, um, even if they have a compaction limit set upon them by the, by the local government or the, or the MRF operator, the driver of the truck is going to compact as much as he compact as much as he possibly can into the one truck load. So just bear that in mind. So let's, let's start with um, what can be recycled in the household or curbside collection system. Once again, it depends on where you live. Generally speaking, the household system is designed for paper and cardboard and containers from the kitchen, the bathroom and the laundry. So if you have that in mind, that pretty much covers all the things that are generally accepted into uh, most common household recycling systems by containers. Um, I'm talking about rigid containers made out of plastic, glass, aluminium, steel, or liquid paperboard. Now, it's not a hard and fast rule as to what is included because the color of the um, the color of the lids on the bins is different in lots of lots of areas in Australia outside of New South Wales, and the range of materials that are accepted into the recycling stream varies almost from council to council, even within cities like Melbourne and Sydney. Believe it or not, this is a load of commingled recycling. It's pretty hard to actually spot the recyclable material in this. I think down towards the bottom right hand corner, I can see a Sprite bottle, but it's got lots and lots of um, flexible packaging, um, shrink wrap um, on the left hand side running from the top to the bottom of the picture. There's um, some plastic tubing and I actually pulled that out of that load. Um, You'll be pleased to know that's New Zealand recycling, not Australian, but um, I've seen exactly the same stuff in Australia too. And I discovered that uh, tubing actually came from a hairdresser who was replacing his um, shampoo and air conditioning line and thought that since it was plastic, it should go in the plastic recycling bin. I'll show you a little bit later why um, long stringing materials are about the last thing that a MRF operator wants. So, the question I ask is, isn't everything manually sorted anyway? So what does it really matter what goes in into the recycling? Well, yes, most big MRFs have got a manual sorting component at the very start, but it's not for sorting out the material. It's actually for pulling out the stuff that really shouldn't be in the recycling in the first place. Um, so this is from a, from a large MRF in Sydney um, and the sorts of materials they're looking to pull out are things that are too big. Now, the bin obviously wasn't in the bin. That's somebody's bin that the uh, collector has managed to shake loose into, um, into the back of the truck, but he didn't know it was in there. So it turned up at the MRF and they had to find a way of getting rid of it. So it's 
all sorts, of, all sorts of things that are too big for the automated recycling system to, to be able to handle. Or they're too dangerous, like gas bottles. Lots and lots of gas bottles go in and somebody somewhere says, gee, it's made out of metal, it's recyclable. I'll put it in the recycling bin. I'm doing the right thing. Uh, the pink ones, when you go up to the Gold Coast, they're full of pink ones. And the pink ones are uh, um, helium gas that are used to inflate party balloons. Um, not sure if that's still the case, but it was last time I visited Murph up there. And things that are too heavy. So car batteries, when you do audits of um, recycling bins, you very rarely come up with a car battery. So until we started um, looking at um, commingled automated systems, we didn't realise just how many batteries were there. And in case you think that I'm being really selective about looking for batteries, here's a few photos from other MRFs just on the day that I visited them. So different MRF, more batteries. Another MRF, more batteries. Another MRF, more batteries again. And car batteries, they're so heavy that they're going to hurt the back of the sorter who pulls them off the, um, off the reject line in the first place. If they go past the sorter, um, I mean, they, they would be pretty hard to miss, but, you know, there might be a reason why the sorter didn't see it. They're going to damage the first lot of uh, screening that they go to. And when they eventually break open, um, which is possibly in the back of the truck, the acid from the battery is going to go all over everything too. So quite hazardous as well. And if you think that's pretty bad, there are lots of other things. So in my uh, rose gallery of uh, photographs, there's a snake, about the most unusual thing. He was dead, fortunately. Um, and hypodermic needles, lots and lots of hypodermic needles. And they're usually not from drug addicts. They're usually, apparently research has been done into this. They're usually from um, people who use the, um, the, the needle for a perfectly legal purpose at home and are just not sure what to do with it. So it goes in the recycling bin. Um, I guess the majority of them go into um, yellow containers or into the garbage bin, but a fair few of them turn up in the recycling bin often in a glass bottle with the lid on, which is um, at least considerate of the needle user. And then lots of other, lots of other things. MRFs do occasionally get money. Yeah, I know that wallet looks um, too clean to have been through the recycling system, but um, the wallet that I actually spotted in recycling disappeared so quickly I couldn't get a photograph of it. Um, so there have been some classic cases of um, very large amounts of cash being found in the recycling system. Usually the, the um, sorter will hand it over, the bigger the amount, the more willing they are to hand it over because if it's that amount of cash and nobody's missing it, it probably comes from people that you wouldn't want to mess with. Um, top right hand corner, it's a hand grenade. You've seen uh, landmines, hand grenades. Um, they're usually put in there by people that uh, have a collection of such things and someone, they die and someone cleans out their house and they go, well, what's this? It's made of metal, it should go in the metal recycling bin. Um, It'd be really inconvenient if it exploded, but it's an inconvenient enough when the whole MRF has to be shut down, the fire brigade called, um, everybody evacuated from the site and you lose at least a day's labour. Bottom left-hand corner is uh, flares, um, particularly at certain times of years of the year when it comes um, for flare changeover on the boats, particularly in coastal areas, get lots and lots of flares. Um, and if a flare goes off, it can start a fire. Bottom right-hand corner is the um, the, one of the topical items um, from the current situation, um, the, um, the mask. I'm getting lots of those. Um, well, they're neither paper nor plastic, but um, I guess if people are throwing in the stormwater, it's probably at least considered that they're throwing them in the recycling bin. Be better, if, better to put them in the garbage bin though. So uh, more education is needed there and, and lots of um, medical things as well. Now, um, Lots of other things we get, um, such as stuffed pets, commonly found, um, uh, false teeth, um, gym equipment. I don't know how many, um, in the larger MRFs that I've worked in, um, there's usually a pile of, uh, of uh, free weights that uh, the sorters have collected, particularly if uh, one of them is a bodybuilder. Um, and um, they're, they're quite commonly found. Um, they have to be pulled out because like a car battery, they can be very damaging to the equipment. Um, I know guys that work on the sorting line that have uh, re-equipped their entire garage with tools they've found from the MRF. Once again, um, uh, Sid Cram Spanner. Um, uh, it, it's made out of metal, I suppose. The person cleaning at the house is um, loath to uh, just throw it in the garbage, so he figures at least I'll get the metal value back from it. Um, 
and uh, plate glass, all, all sorts of the wrong sort of glass, large mirrors, plate glass, um, and um, microwave turntables, uh, which are made out of heat resistant glass and aren't recyclable in the normal glass system. The list is pretty much endless. Back to the question of, um, isn't everything sorted out of the MRF? The answer of course was no, except in South Australia. So in South Australia, because it's got a container deposit system, um, ha which has been operating since the 1970s, the containers are generally, in, uh, in most of the MRFs I've been to there, uh, are generally uh, sorted out by hand. So you end up with um, uh, probably the cleanest container deposit uh, material in Australia, um, but it's extremely time consuming. So aside from South Australia, um, yep, the, the MRF isn't for sorting materials unless it's a really small MRF. Um, it's for pulling out, the, the hand sorting is for pulling out hazardous and dangerous and unwanted materials. So going through the equipment that um, is in the MRF, the, the list of types of, equi of equipment is very extensive and the, I guess it's like accessories in a new car. Um, the MRF operator or the MRF designer um, picks uh, which uh, pieces of equipment they're going to use uh, um, in their particular MRF. So um, a trommel is a typical piece of equipment found in, in lots of MRFs. It's basically a rotating cylinder that the material passes through. Um, items that are smaller than the size of the holes in the trommel will fall through onto the conveyor belt below. Items that are larger pass through. So it's, it's for the first pass of sorting based on size. And sometimes there are, there are several there's a series of several trommels um, with um, uh, gradually um, larger um, holes in the, in the trommel so that um, the MRF operator is able to segregate between um, larger and larger materials. Screens, you've possibly heard about sorting screens in a MRF. Here's an example of um, a couple of angled sorting screens in a large MRF. So, the material passes over the screen. I'll show you a close up of the little star screens, little stars in the screen in a minute. Um, it propels the material over the top. These ones are angled so that um, a soft drink bottle or a glass bottle that is still whole will roll down towards the center and uh, fall into the channel. Uh, that's a bank of fans in the middle that blows the light material up back onto the screen. So paper and cardboard in theory should stay on the screen and the three dimensional materials roll into the center. Uh, just remembering what I said about how um, the compactor truck compacts the material, it's only the material that hasn't been flattened by that that ends up in the channel. So here's a screen um, in the early life of a MRF, so you can see it before material ever went onto it. Um, the, the, you can see it's got little, um, little wheels or stars. They come in various different configurations, sometimes they're um, triangles or, or, or their um, other geometric shapes with uh, various faces to them. But the idea is that they rotate around in those axles. They move all of the material in the direction that it's uh, traveling in the MRF. Anything that is smaller than the gaps between the axles and the gaps between the, um, the discs, um, they're sometimes called a disc screen, anything smaller will fall down onto either the conveyor belt below or in this case, the smaller screen below. So you've got you can, um, in one pass, separate um, between all sorts of different sizes of material. And right at the very bottom of, of that bank of uh, two or three screens, there's a conveyor belt that will take the fine material, the broken up glass, all the little things that aren't going to get recycled, like the um, soft drink bottle lids that aren't attached to a bottle still, um, bottle, metal bottle caps and everything else that's in the recycling. Here's a close-up of those particular um, finger wheels in that star screen. So you can see um, as they start rotating, they're moving the material in the direction of uh, travel of, uh, of the recyclables and um, everything's falling in the gap. The gap doesn't look very big because that was shot from a distance away with a big lens. Um, now, just imagine what would happen if you put material that had a lot of stringy material in it, like rope or like garden hoses, or like chains or electrical flex, or big long pieces of shrink wrap on that. Yep, you can imagine it gets wrapped around and around and around and eventually there's too much for the screen to keep on rotating. And um, if it's uh, a powerful enough motor driving it, it'll keep rotating and eventually it'll catch fire. So 
most MRFs that have got these screens have to stop regularly and people jump up onto the screen with a cutting knife and cut off the material that's wrapped around it. Then we go to the near infrared sorting, the more high tech sorting of um, polymers and fibrous material. So you can see from that shot, the material is moving fast, pretty moving through pretty quickly. I and mean, it's going under a, a bank of um, light sensors that determine uh, what is the type of polymer that it's looking at. So it's really, they're really designed to detect polymers or to detect whether something is a polymer or not a polymer. So if you have mixed cardboard and plastic, this will detect what is plastic and what is cardboard. It's generally a yes, no question that it's asking the material. So you can detect one polymer versus every other polymer, one color versus every other color, polymer versus fiber. Um, and MRFs have a series or a whole bank of these, um, of these near infrared sorting heads um, required to um, make that decision and, and sort out between um, uh, lots and lots of mixed uh, fiber and plastic material. Looking a bit closer, you can see as the material gets closer um, to the bed of lights, um, the, uh, the, the light, which isn't really a laser, but people call them lasers, um, it, it, reads, it reads the material that's under that particular light. It sends a message through the um, computer controlling it to the little bank of air jets that correspond with the position of the light. And you can see, um, if it was moving, you'd see better. But as it goes over the edge of the, um, of the waterfall there, if you like, the little air jet spits out a spit of air just where it saw the thing that it's trying to reject into a different stream. You can't really see it there, but um, further to the right of the path that the material's taking um, is a divider. So the material that hasn't been spat out by the air jet just falls down directly below. The material that it is seeking and identified and is seeking is spat over the other side of the divider, so it's able to be separated into two streams. That's pretty much it in a nutshell for that type of sorting. Then we have eddy current separators that are designed to separate aluminium and other non-ferrous material. So it basically works by repelling the material as a similar sort of divider system, the, magne the um, magnetic field or the anti-magnetic field from the um, highly rotating magnet, uh, highly rotating electrical field, um, repels the aluminium or non-ferrous material. It goes on the other side of the divider. I assume that you understand how a belt magnet works. Um, that just works on steel and other ferrous material uh, passing continuously over the top of the stream of material and pulls out anything that's got steel content in it. And in theory, we get a lovely bale of sorted aluminium worth lots of money at the other end. Um, these systems aren't perfect. Aluminium is probably the best example of, of um, really clean material delivered because it repels only aluminium and other non-ferrous material. Um, but for instance, um, liquid paperboard, uh, aseptic liquid paperboard, um, often has an aluminium foil layer inside of it. And uh, if you set the mag, if you set the eddy current separator too strong, it'll read that as an aluminium too. When the can is crushed in the back of the compactor truck, sometimes it's crushed around a plastic container and both of them get rid as aluminium. Um, the um, near infrared system pretty much eventually can perfectly sort plastics and there's a load of uh, pretty clean uh, milk bottles, high density polyethylene that's been sorted out. So in theory, um, it does a really good job. A more realistic picture of a, of a MRF um, uh, sorting high volumes would uh, contain quite a bit of contamination in that as well. However, this is a recyclable material or rejected recyclable material that ends up in another country. And this is the only material, uh, I think, that programs like um, 60 Minutes and um, uh, A Current Affair are really interested in. They're not really interested in seeing the really good results, they're interested in seeing the really bad results. Uh, and this was the reason why China and other countries um, stopped accepting mixed waste material. Um, and uh, you can see it's, it's not very pleasant material at all. So let's go to some myths quick, quickly. Um, the first myth is that recycling isn't real. You hear this all the time. We've been hearing it for 20 or 30 years. Some quite famous people have used their platform to say they saw a garbage truck and it was picking up recycling bins or they followed a truck and it had recycling on it. It went to the tip, not to, uh, not to the uh, recycling station. Um, well, 
Um, you'd have to wonder, wouldn't you, why a council would invest so much money in education and um, in putting the wheels on the road to take something all to the same destination. Occasionally a load may be so contaminated, as it has been in the last few months, that it might go straight to the tip, or there might be the end of a run that um, the garbage truck can't uh, collect. So he asked his mate in the recycling truck who had finished his load to, um, to take the garbage. So that, that's why it goes there. But generally speaking, speaking, of course, recycling is real. Um, and uh, the money tells the story. I guess is the question for everybody. Um, and we hear it all the time. The packaging, in, packaging industry isn't really serious about changing its behavior. It wants to just keep going with the status quo. Um, there's no real answer to that. I guess we can only really answer it by showing the community generally that we are serious about it. Um, I guess the, the feeling you, you, the impression you would get in recent years is that all Australian recycling is mostly dumped unsorted in Southeast Asia. Um, what would be the benefit? The money, the, 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 it just doesn't make financial sense. Why would you pay to collect something um, and then in recent years pay the council a gate fee? or pay the council um, a commodity fee uh, to, to accept their recycling, then pay for it to be shipped to Asia and, and then have somebody just dump it and burn it. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. I'm sure there have been examples of contaminated material going there, but um, generally speaking for recycling, it doesn't happen. I think I've pretty much already answered this, but there's, there's still lots of people out there that think everything gets sorted out in a big room by people somewhere and um, they've got time to read the plastic code on the bottom of the bottle and that's how the decision's made. It's not. It's, uh, it's got to be in the design of the material, not in something that's actually written under the bottom of the bottle. The number in the triangle in the Mobius sloop on the bottle means it's recycled but doesn't. That just means it's made out of a certain polymer. The Australian recycling label is probably the only system in Australia um, and one of the few systems in the world that can reliably tell you whether something's recyclable or not and where it should go to. And this is a good one. We shouldn't have to pay for recycling. The materials are so valuable, um, it should be lowering, lowering production costs. Somebody's pocketing the money. The fact of the matter is recycling is marginal at best. And there are got to be, there's got to be other reasons why we recycle other than the market's good at the moment, we should start recycling again. And those reasons have got to be based around reducing global warming, um, decreasing our um, greenhouse gas impact, um, saving our resources, um, and uh, and uh, improving the reputation of, um, of of your product because that's what the community wants. And food grade packaging can't be made from recycled materials. Well, it can, but the material is is easier to process if it's just one polymer, and it's easier to process if it's clean when you when you receive it. And I'm sure Simon will tell you more about that in a minute. And then the challenges. Well, this, this could be a list of 100 things rather than just half a dozen. So the challenges, and I'm not going to try and answer all of these, but um, how can we really expand all of the materials that we collect? Because that first list that I showed you of what's in theory recyclable um, doesn't really begin to address all the things we take, in, we take into our home. Um, is the current system really appropriate for dealing with an expanded range of materials, far expanded on what it was originally designed to do. Education is obviously going to be, and always has been, probably the main key into getting the people who generate the material from the home to give it to us in a better form. How do we educate 26 million stakeholders to use the right pen? How do we engage the community when the popular media, is, media continues, continues to say, don't trust recyclers, it's all a scam? And how to recover materials compete with cheap virgin materials? Well, there's a question for you. And how does recycling generally compete with cheap disposal? Well, a waste levy, you would think, would answer that. But we've got the highest waste levy in Australia and New South Wales. And one of the perverse outcomes of that was that a lot of material ended up going to cheaper landfills in Queensland. So sorry I've given you more questions than, than, than answers, but I'm happy at a later time to try and answer some of those. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Lee. That's fantastic. There was lots of fantastic insights in there and I'm sure everyone learned a lot from that. And I'll just quickly let everyone know to make sure you're adding any questions in the Q&A box so we can get to them at the end. 
Um, thank you, Lee, for giving up your control. I'll get Simon to grab control of the slides now, if you can there, Simon. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen Simon on LinkedIn or lots of Vanden's um, uh, online platforms, Simon is a Managing Director at Vanden Recycling. Um, Vanden have offices across Australia, Hong Kong, Finland, Turkey and the UK. They offer total supply chain engagement on sustainability, so they help not only transform waste into commodities, but they also connect worldwide supply and demand of recyclable plastic and aim to change the perception of plastic packaging by sharing expertise through consulting, training and education. Simon has a passion for the why behind what makes things work. Um, creating his own digital content has allowed him to share his detailed industry knowledge with a broad audience. Uh, and in Simon's own words, he enjoys adding some source to what can otherwise be a bit bland and making it as engaging as possible. So we're looking forward to hearing or seeing some of that source today, Simon. So take it away for us. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lily, for the introduction. Uh, really great to see all you guys on today. Just excuse my printer in the background. Um, awesome presentation, Lee. That, uh, that was fantastic. Um, a lot of very insightful things there. And in fact, I think that presentation, Lee, um, you know, should be shared amongst the community quite widely. So um, well done on that, mate. Um, I just want to pick up, you know, there's a lot of similarities between, um, you know, uh, where where Lee was going with this and, and where we sort of pick up our piece and um, and the waste management sector, the recycling, uh, the plastic recycling sector and the packaging sector all have to work closely together. So Look, guys, I'll put a bit of a different spin on this today and I hope when we get to the Q&A, you can dig a bit deeper with me. But I want to challenge uh, some of the perceptions about plastic recycling that we all have. And, um, you know, at Van, we believe plastic is a valuable resource and that it should be used time and time again. And a lot of the, a lot of the time I hear things like, you know, don't you just bail it up and send it overseas? And Lee touched on that before. Don't you just chop it up and melt it down into park benches? isn't recycled plastic uh, inferior to a, to a virgin made product? So these are common questions that we get. And today I wanna to step you guys through this. Okay, so what I wanna look at is, um, I, I, I wanna look at the concept of plastic recycling is a manufacturing business that produces high performance products, okay? Now, the way we're gonna look at this is I'm gonna give you guys some, some comparisons to what we might assume is a high performance product. So you may all be familiar with this type of high performance product, which on the weekend won the Italian Grand Prix. But you may not be aware of that a very similar type of high performance product might be these items that pop up on your screen right now. Now these are both very uh, intricate extrusion um, lines that do food grade, um, uh, food contact or food, food grade resin. There's a few commonalities between these high performance products. Um, all of them, uh, have a value between USD uh, two and a half million dollars and USD upwards of five million dollars. Um, all of these high performance pieces of equipment are doing multiple calculations per second, making adjustments, making um, multiple changes to the way that they're either handling or the way that they're processing material. So I really want to look at is our industry a high performance industry when we look at the type of equipment that we're operating and then what are the gaps that we're gonna have? And I'm gonna try and step that through over the presentation today. So when we talk about high performance products when it comes to what we might consume, all of these products that you can see in front of you have been designed to perform in a certain way. So we've got the dairy sector there and we've got cheeses on the shelf. They all have packaging around them that's designed to perform in a certain way and the same with the meat product on the shelf there. That packaging is designed essentially to stop the transfer of oxygen from the outside of the packaging getting into the inside of the packaging to deteriorate the meat product that's inside there. And we've got medical type products there which have also been designed for a certain what? Performance criteria. As has that uh, plastic tracking that's used in a, uh, in a factory, it's got a certain performance criteria that it must meet and so you know, if that plastic tracking was to break down on a conveyor line, then it could cause thousands of dollars of damage. And then at the bottom there, we've got all your normal carbonated soft drink bottles, water bottles, uh, juice bottles, um, milk drink bottles. Again, are all designed to 
to meet a certain performance. So our packaging is designed for a certain performance. And one of the big things that we're all asking of our packaging companies is how can we design for this performance, design it to be recycled, and then to include recycled content when we are actually manufacturing it. So who's asking for the who's asking for the high performance? Who's who's demanding the high performance of these products? Like why would we be making them in the first place? So let's have a think about that. Who might be demanding the high performance of these products? And it, it very well could be Violet. It, it definitely could be Violet. But I don't think it's just Violet on her own either. I mean, she doesn't care when she she doesn't care how 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 it's made. She wants it now. But in fact. It's not just Violet who cares about this, it's all of us. It's the entire community, it's us as consumers. When we're looking at products on a shelf, we want to make, be able to go into a supermarket and choose a fresh product, and that's why it's packaged. We also go into a supermarket and we choose a product that might be sustainable. So we might be looking at these things like the packaging uh, is made from recycled content, it is recyclable, and the brand itself is sustainable. And then as consumers, we do want it now. That's a fact, we do want it now. And if anything COVID's taught us is we want things delivered to our door or we need things delivered to our door. So the way that we buy, the way that this product gets delivered to us is changing. And it's, been, it's, it's faster and faster and the technology's growing. So we're looking at new delivery technologies. I mean, Butcher's Box up there in the right-hand corner is a classic example of a wholesale meat business going online and delivering fresh to the door. That wasn't heard of 10 or 15 years ago, maybe not even five years ago. So I want us to think about that. Where is the drive for this performance coming from? So we do need to rethink about, re rethink about this very, very differently. And it's one of the things we're really passionate and, uh, and feel very strong about changing the perception um, about plastic. And our aim is to inspire the future supply, not just recycle it, we want to inspire the future supply. So that's what I want to touch on today. And I want to try and step you through what that might look like and how we might get there. So the next, the next uh, slide I've got here is understanding recyclability and value, okay? So there is this big misconception that a product's not recyclable and that it has a certain value or it's worth less. So I'm going to try and take you through this step by step and let you start to understand some of the things that we look at as a plastic recycler of what makes it recycle, recyclable and what might impact its value, okay? So I'm gonna dive deep into each of these points. And ultimately what we're always assessing is the gap between what it is now and what it needs to be or what it will be in the future. And, and that gap is the value. So let's, let's just take a quick look at this. So what are we making? So we wanna have a look at, are we making a recycled resin or are we making an end product? So let's take a look at, we've got some recycled resin on, on the left there and we've got an end product on the right. So if we look at the recycled resin, the idea is to get that plastic as close as possible to the original material quality. In the case of recycled resin, it's virgin resin or prime material. And if we look at the end product, we're trying to create the most value or useful product possible. So for example, if we were gonna make this resin into a plastic bag, it might be less valuable than if we were making a component for a car. So that's, that's one of the factors that we're looking at in terms of understanding recyclability and value. The second one is, what does it look like now? And this is one of the reasons Vanden does invest very, very heavily on our people and train our people to be able to assess material on the ground, because that's where you need to really understand what it looks like and how it's presented at its source. And some of the things that we're looking at here, if I just pop through to the next slide, which, sorry about that guys. So what does it look like now? So we're looking at the purity of the material. If it's contaminated, if it's mixed with other plastics, if there's other clips, uh, things like paper clips, um, metal in there, other, other contaminants. So um, I'm just picking up on this top, top picture here, if you take a look at those bales there, which by the way, I haven't seen bales like that anywhere in Australia for a very, very long time, but you can take a look at that and go, okay, that's mixed with other plastics. It's definitely got metal in there. It's definitely got paper in there. It's definitely got cardboard in there. Um, it's definitely been sitting out in the sun. So it's definitely gonna be uh, devalued by the fact it's sitting out in the sun and deteriorating. Whereas the bales below are what we'd see and what we did see earlier in Lee's presentation these are clean, single stream, single source, 
HDP in milk bottles in this case. So the quality, the purity and contamination certainly has an impact on the value of the material. The second thing that we're looking at is uh, colour and cleanliness. And I want to tie these two together for you guys. And so in the middle, I've got two different types of flake. And uh, at the top, I've got a coloured uh, PET flake, which is a mix of different colours, white, green, brown. And down the bottom, we've got a natural flake. And then over on the right hand side, I've got two different grades of LDP film here. We've got a natural LDP film at the top and we've got a coloured LDP film at the bottom. And what I want to talk about is all plastic starts its life um, either natural or transparent. So the further it is away from that original form, the less valuable it is. So the basic rule of order we, when it comes to polymers is natural, natural blue, uh, white, uh, blue, and then a mix of colours, and then you get into mixed and black, okay? And PT is a little bit of the exception here because transparent blue is second most valuable. White is no more valuable than the other colours when it comes to PET. So we have to put a lot of time and effort into ensuring that the material is segregated at source, that it is clean, and that we are segregating colours. Um, the third factor that has an impact on the value of recyclability is also the additives that are used to manufacture a plastic, okay? So there are a range of different additives that are used in plastic for different performance requirements, okay? So some of the fillers might be calcium carbonate or tau. This is a common uh, filler that's used to either lower the material cost or, or alter other material properties. And then we look at things like glass fillers, which are used to strengthen materials. Um, these both limit the possibility um, of end recycling markets. And so these are some of the things that do affect the value. So fillers is one of them. Fire retardants, okay? So we do put FR fire retardant in different materials and it's to suppress or delay combustion. So typical areas you'll find fire retardant might be in your TV casing, in your computer casing, in your home white goods. These are common areas where you might find some FR material. And then of course, we have master batch. Now master batch is a solid or liquid additive used for plastics and mainly for coloring, but it also allows the processor uh, to color uh, raw polymer economically also. So these are things that are added to plastic that can change the recyclability and the value of them. And then finally, I wanna look at uh, what is the total cost of, um, of uh, converting. So you know, what, is, what is the total cost of conversion? And simply what we're gonna look at here is we're gonna look at the cost of the energy, the logistics, the equipment, the space, the people, all of that that it takes to actually convert this plastic into either a, a, a resin or then back into an end product. And Lee touched on some of this before in the waste sector and collecting material and processing it out of MRF. Um, we're talking about efficiencies in transport and this is no different. We are definitely looking at efficiencies and that's what it is, it's about the total cost to convert the material. So when we're looking at um, conversion and the cost of conversion, the first thing we're looking at is the cost of transport. And with plastic, we're looking at um, the volume. So the material there is to collect, the lower the unit cost of collection. So the more material there is, the lower unit cost of the collection. And then we're also looking at the density. So you know how well is the material packed together? That'll determine the volume that can be loaded onto a truck, how much space it's taking up, so, you know, baling is one common way of getting density like we're seeing back in these slides here. Um, you can also use stillages for post-production collections. But in terms of post-consumer material, baling is definitely one of the best ways to make sure that we're getting efficiencies in cost of collection. The next thing that I want to look at is uh, polymer density. So, um, when it comes to polymer density, the thing that we want to focus on is machinery output. Now, I've just popped up a slide here. Uh, for a PET wash bottle plant, so my good friends at Telford Smith, um, this is an infographic of one of their wash plants, and I've got a few photos that'll come after this. You guys can have a good look at this as I talk about this. But when it comes to polymer density, we're talking about machinery output here. So, you know, the key to recycling profitability is maximising production output. So if you kind of want to have a little bit of a look at this facility here, I mean, you're talking about spending between five and six million dollars USD, that's just for the plant, nevertheless the building, uh, the wastewater, and all the other things that go along with that. So you wanna make sure that if you're running this plant, it's running efficiently. 
So we're looking at, you know, uh, machinery output. So, you know, for example, if the material is being processed, uh, processed and it has a lower density, it'll be light and fluffy. It will not through, move through the production line as quickly, um, you know, as other materials. So for example, you know, polypropylene film versus a polypropylene crate uh, will move very differently through a production uh, facility. Um, and then we could do the same for say, expanded polystyrene and uh, polystyrene trays. You know, they will perform very, very differently when they're moving through a production facility like this. And then we look at the per unit cost. So once you start to put all this together, you know, what is it actually costing to run this facility? So, you know, if you wanna have a bit of a look at this, you know, the cost to run a production line might be say $200 per hour, and you might be running PP crates and they have an output of 1.5 metric tons per hour. So that might be costing you $133 an hour uh, per, per ton to run that material. Whereas if we looked at say a PP film and the output was only one metric ton, that processing cost would be somewhere like $200 per metric ton. So the output difference may seem small, but the cost difference is actually quite big. So again, this is all to you know, emphasize again, um, it's very, very critical that we're assessing material at its source before we go and stick it into a plant like this. It is very, very uh, a, a massive integral part of that. So then we get to the, uh, the actual processing in the plant that you can see on the, on the infographic here and the processing and purification. So as you can see here, you've still got some upfront sorting with the trommel, metal separators, label and collar separation, non-ferrous separation, some very similar equipment to what you saw with Lee. Um, you've then still got some bottle sorters um, because there still may be other bottles and other contamination that may go in there. Again, our, uh, infrared technology, very, very similar to what Lee showed as well. And then you start to get into the shredding, granulating, um, and then uh, from there we move into the washing. And then as we move further down the line, then we start to get into the purity of the material on the back end, back end of this plant. So in the next slide, you'll see, um, you know, here's a, a very similar piece of equipment to what Lee showed in his slide. And again, this is infrared, it's for, uh, it's for bottle, bottle sorting. Um, and then you've got the, uh, the sink swim tank next to that. Again, that's part of the washing process. Um, I've just popped a photo in the left-hand corner here of how big uh, the inside of a shredder can be. And then, uh, and then on the right-hand side, um, I've got a bagging station where you can see where the product is finished. So what I want you all also to think about, and this is a shortcut you can all use to think about how we determine value, is to think about where is that material in its life cycle? You know, plastics are created, they're transported, they're manufactured, they're distributed, they're sold, they're consumed. The further away it is from its started life, it's more likely to be worth less. So for example, po post-production factory scrap is worth more than post-consumer scrap, okay? Again, it's closer to where it started its life than, than being at the end of its life. And it's kind of no different to buying a car. The newer lease miles on the car, versus a new car, you know, which one's going to cost less to restore or get back into prime condition, obviously the newer model is going to be closer to being able to uh, get back into that prime condition. So it's kind of the same with plastic, if that makes sense for you guys. So as we move through this, I want to get to this point of understanding that, you know, plastic recycling is actually an integral part of the manufacturing process and manufacturing supply chain. So, you know, we're not only having to recycle these materials, we're having to test and understand them from a polymer level. We're having to run great logistical, uh, um, great logistic operations to get it from A to B. And then it's going back into manufacturers who are manufacturing products for high performance. So, you know, on the left there, we've got some kayaks which are used in high performance. They're used in the Olympics. We've got in the middle there a bottling plant, which is you know uh, filling uh, soft drink bottles and, and water bottles, you know at very high rates, and they cannot have failure rates. And when they do, it's very costly to the business. So these are these are high performance businesses, and uh, that's why plastic uh, plastic recycling is an integral part of the manufacturing supply chain. So 
if we come back to the start, what I want you to think about is why am I saying that, you know, uh, plastic recycling is in fact a high performance manufacturing business. And if we go back to the back end of the MRF where we finished off with Lee, you know, where we have the capability to collect bailed PET bottles from a MRF that everyone's put in their curbside bin. We're able to process that into a flake. We're then able to process that through an extrusion line and make it food contact again, or put it into a food contact resin that can be used again. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, that is everything about high performance. So we need to make sure that we are continuing to think about this as high performance. Okay, so what I want you all to think about is um, what on earth does Simon mean about high performance and plastic recycling? Well, Here's, an, here, here's the meaning of high performance when it comes to organisations. The ability to deliver over a prolonged period of time meaningful, measurable, sustainable results for people or, um, or, or the organisations in existence. So I really want you guys to think about this when it comes to high performance and really looking at plastic recycling different. We are moving to a high performance industry. There are going to be gaps. And uh, we're going to need the technical capabilities to, fit, to, to fill these gaps as we move towards what the future is. And that is uh, making sure all of our recycled material can be used here in Australia. So I hope that's given you guys a little bit of an insight into, um, you know, recyclability and value. And just a little bit of a different spin on it today. I've tried to come up with something different. And uh, I hope it all made sense. And if not, it's Q&A coming up. Plus... Any of the things I spoke about, you can, um, you know, obviously go and check out any of the videos on any of those topics. Thank you very much, Simon. I agree. That was fantastic and a nice tie together between where Lee um, finished and where Simon brought it all the way back to tie it all in together. So hopefully you all learnt a lot. I know that we're a bit close to the end of time here, but if you do have time to stay on board, we'll try and answer a couple of questions to make sure we um, can cover some extra topics. And Lee has gone through and answered a few as we have gone. So thank you very much, Lee. And if hopefully everyone um, at home can see those answers as well. Um, the first one that we'll quickly touch on is, um, would a separate plastics bin be better than a separate glass bin? So there has been a little bit of investigation lately and from lots of different states as to whether or not separate bins are, um, are useful. We, Interested to hear your thoughts, maybe first, Simon, and then yours as well, Lee. A separate, uh, a separate plastics bin to a separate glass bin. Did you say um, that was the question? Bill? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah just look, a separate, I, separating in general, I guess. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess. Um, what's my view on it? I think you can have way too many bins. By the way, I think you need to be careful with that. Um, I think we probably need to focus maybe, um, you know, obviously getting, taking the glass out of the other bin first. And then, um, I, I mean, I might be speaking on behalf of Lee here, but I think when it comes to the plastics and, and the paper, um, then the MRFs uh, could certainly do that job. And uh, we probably just need to start picking uh, plastic a little, a little bit better, um, which can be done at, at a MRF level. So I'm not sure we need another bin for plastics when I look at it from a holistic, holistic point of view. Thanks, Simon. And Lee, your thoughts on that one? Okay, yeah, obviously um, having everything in a separate bin all of its own is gonna deliver you the cleanest stream, but you've gotta bear in mind that there's uh, gonna be uh, a point of diminishing return because you've gotta have a separate truck picking up each separate bin. So um, the the greenhouse gases and the, and the, and the fuel used by the truck is obviously um, going to eventually be greater than uh, what you've saved the environment by, by separating out the materials. Um, it, like I said in my answer online, it, 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 it'll depend on um, what the uh, sort of material is focused on. Um, you know, so if, if somebody's main market is uh, selling paper and cardboard, they want the cardboard to be separated out. Um, if, they're, if they're pretty much selling mixed material, they, most people don't want the glass in with it because the glass breaks in the compaction process, ends up as fines they've got to get rid of, um, and uh, the little shards of glass stick into the um, into the cardboard and paper. So I personally think getting glass into a separate system is a good first step. Um, and then uh, restricting 
the number of different types of material and getting them as clean as possible is a better answer than having a million bins. Thank you both, very good points there. Uh, we have had some questions um, around MRF standards. The first one was around bin colour, which you touched on, Lee. Um, and the other one is about um, standard quality of bales, particularly for plastics that will ideally then help uh, with that quality that Simon was talking about. So um, any thoughts on standards for MRF, well, for bins, bin colours, and then for MRF quality? Lee, would you like to start well, with that? Well, there, there is an Australian standard for bin colour. I I just think that every council should adopt it. Um, yeah, I mean, it's harmonisation of um, most things to do with waste um, has got to be uh, one of the keys. When you're dealing with disparate systems, how can you possibly succeed? Um, going through to bale quality, um, yeah, most, most purchases and reuses of material, no matter if it's cardboard, paper, a grade of plastic or aluminium, they'll have quality standards that, that um, the generator has to meet. So. Um, quality is, is the number one key to, uh, to reusability. Thanks, Lee. And your thoughts on that one, Simon? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think some standardised, I mean, like Lee said, I think the, the, the bin system being standardised, um, if there's a standard for it, then we do need every council following it. I think at, there has been a bit of a, a bit of a danger where we've got too many groups trying to do too many different things, okay? And then I think that causes uh, problems because um, we've got one group going off in one direction, another group going off another. We do all need to get together on this and go, okay, hey, this is the system we're going to use. Um, we do need to be a little bit flexible. Like if I compare metro to regional, for example, living in a, an apartment block compared to, um, you know, a house allotment with, you know, 900 square metres is very, very different. But some standardisation is definitely really, really important there. And um, I also think the other... Um, the other area, obviously, um, you know, Lee's touched on it is um, from the MRF side of things is um, a little bit of standardisation um, across that, but that that's coming actually. The investment in the MRF industry is there. And, um, you know, from what I see on the ground, you know, products are getting better and better. Fantastic. Thank you both for that one. Uh, the next question we've got there is what about coloured PET? Now, Simon, you touched a little bit on this one um, and I guess it can vary uh, as to whether or not it's a consumer PET versus a B2B PET as well yeah. as those streams uh, yeah. are really different so maybe if you want to touch on sort of you, you did talk about how yeah. colour affects quality if you, if you can touch yeah. a bit more on that one. Yeah so everyone talks about you know I get asked this question a lot particularly on coloured coloured PET um, look it's definitely 100% recyclable um, yes it holds a different value because it goes into a different product. So a quick example would be um, like that middle picture I showed where you've got, um, you know, coloured PET flake. That's probably going to go into something like PET strapping. That's an industrial application where the natural flake is going to go back into a bottle or go back into a food tray. And uh, those products have a higher value. And so that's why there is a, a value gap between coloured PET and uh, a natural PET, for example. And that's why some of the language that's been used around it is confusing because we take low value, meaning it's not recyclable. And that's not the case. And we need to be really clear about that. And that's hopefully what I've tried to get in there a little bit today. But, um, you know, uh, coloured PET is difficult because there's less end, uh, end market uses for it as there is to natural. Lee, did you have a comment on that one at all? Yeah, I know that in Japan they've actually bitten the bullet on this and they've said that soft drink bottles are to be made just in uh, in, in clear PET now yep. uh, because uh, you can't, um, you can't uh, really apply a circular market to a coloured soft drink bottle. No, one, no one's going to collect enough mid-green soft drink bottles to remake a green soft drink bottle. Um, the uh, reprocessing plants are only ever going to make... Uh, clear PET and for that they need to have input of clear PET. So yeah, there's, there's uses for it, but um, the simplest idea I think would be to, uh, would, would, would be to limit the range of colors that stuff is made and it applies not just to PET, but to HDP as well. That's why natural milk bottle color is so valuable because there's so much of it and um, the other colored material you can remake into something, but usually not back into the thing that it was originally because you don't get enough of it in one place. 
That's a great one. Thank you, Lee. Uh, the next one we have an uh, anonymous question. Uh, I thought it'd be a good one to touch on because there is a lot happening at the moment, but what support is being provided by federal government uh, to support recycling infrastructure? Is all infrastructure privately owned or do local authorities operate it? Uh, Lee, would you like to touch on that one first and then Simon? Uh, you already did a quick answer online. Um, and um, yep, the federal government and the state government are pouring lots of money into, into um, uh, uh, proposed infrastructure grants, and uh, so they should because they collect so much money in waste levies. Um, in fact, in most states, they're sitting on a pile of money that's unspent. I'm not sure that uh, investing just in infrastructure really is the answer. We need better product design. Uh, we need harmonisation of all of the things to do with recycling. Uh, we need to develop um, local markets for the materials and, and um, a local demand and uh, support for an acceptance for um, recycled content. Um, really, that's how, you get a, that's how you get a circular economy going, not just by saying we're going to spend more money on, on building more complex factories. They're going to deal with the problem as we've got it. Let's change the problem. And Simon, your thoughts on that one? Yeah, uh, just the only bit I'd add to what Lee said is he, he's, he's exactly right, is um, we need to actually spend a bit of money in some other areas too. I think I'm not saying the infrastructure bit is the easy bit, right? Uh, that needs to be here because we lack it, but we need to develop end markets for where the product's going to go. And um, that's that's a technical problem to solve as well. So, you know, we, we do need to build up uh, technical capabilities um, in this industry. And uh, it's one of the reasons why I actually brought up why we're moving to a high performance industry today, because um, I don't think people realize how technical this equipment is to operate. And it's very much why I gave the analogy between a, a Formula One car and a plastic extrusion line. Like there's 22 people a year who have the privilege to drive a Formula One car. And uh, a plastic extrusion line is just as complicated. It's doing mathematical equations like you wouldn't believe uh, the temperature of infeed, uh, you know, uh, the, the type of screw. It's just, I won't get into it now, but um, we are going to need technical capabilities to actually reuse this product. Very, very true. All right, thank you both very much. I can see there's lots of questions in the box, but we have definitely run over time. So we thank everyone very much uh, for joining us today. Hopefully we've shed some light on how complex and interdependent the recycling ecosystem is. We hope you've all learnt something new and, and taken away some, potentially some tangible actions that you can embed into maybe your business or your day-to-day -day lives, or maybe just a newfound interest into digging into some more detail. So I apologise we couldn't get to all of the questions, but I'm sure Simon and Lee would be more than happy to hear from you um, if you do have any other questions. And likewise, do feel free to get in contact with APCO and we can put you in touch or we can help answer your questions as well. And our next webinar topic will be a research fest. So pulling together industry and academia uh, that will be going through some new research that's in the pipeline. So look out for the link to register for that one on the 23rd of September. And please join me in thanking our fantastic guest speakers today for their insightful presentations uh, to help us all understand that journey that packaging takes beyond the bin. So thank you very much, Lee and Simon, and thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.